Hello, welcome back. We are in chapter 18 of Materials Kinetics, which is devoted to the concept of energy landscapes. Um, this is a really broad and important topic across all of material science, uh, which is also at the cutting edge of computational material science. So I'm really excited to talk about energy landscapes with you. Uh, first, we're going to start with what is an energy landscape and some important terminology, including inherent structures and transition points. Um, then we're going to cover how do we actually calculate the kinetics of a system based on its energy landscape, uh, introducing the concept of master equation dynamics. We're going to discuss uh, how do we locate transition points in an energy landscape, uh, also the concept of disconnectivity graphs, and then I'm going to give you a simple example. This is a simplified energy landscape that I'm calling the minimalist landscape model, and this leads to an explanation of um, what's called alpha and beta relaxation modes, also known as primary and secondary relaxation modes. So let's get started with the concept of an energy landscape. Um, now consider that you know any material is made up of atoms, right? And each atom has its own position. If we are in a three-dimensional space, as most of us are, um, then each atom would have three coordinates. So it would have an X position, a Y position, and a Z position. So every atom has three coordinates that define its position in three-dimensional space. Now, if you have N number of atoms, that means that there are three N number of um, individual coordinates because every single one of those N atoms has its own X position, its own Y position, and its own Z position. And then if you consider like any possible configuration of, of atoms, so for any given combination of atomic positions, one can calculate a potential energy that is associated with those um, positions. Um, if the positions are in you know, a, a favorable combination of, of atomic positions, that would be a lower potential energy. Um, there's also many ways to construct unfavorable configurations of atoms, which would correspond to a higher potential energy. But if we calculate all the potential energies associated with every possible combination of atomic positions, that gives us what's called the potential energy landscape of the system. And an example of that is shown here. Um, this shows a potential energy landscape where you've got some sort of configurational coordinate here along the x-axis, and then a potential energy along the y-axis. And the potential energy landscape has many peaks, many valleys. Uh, the valleys correspond to more energetically favorable configurations of atoms, the peaks correspond to less energetically favorable configurations of, of atoms. Now this, what I'm showing here is, is just um, across some one dimensional configuration. In reality, if you have an N uh, atom system, so N number of atoms, and there are um, three coordinates per atom. So that means that we actually have a three N dimensional system. So this is in a three N dimensional hyperspace. So the energy landscape, this potential energy landscape is actually an energy landscape in a three N dimensional system, which is um, impossible for me to visualize here on the slide. And so what I'm showing here is just kind of a, a simplified um, picture of it in one dimension. But consider that in this three N dimensional space, there are regions that have high potential energy, which are unfavorable, regions that have low potential energy, which are more favorable. And there is a large number of minima in that energy landscape. Uh, now the, the concept of all of this um, and, and how to divide um, energy landscapes into these different regions goes back to the work of Frank Stillinger back in the 1980s, the early 1980s. And he proposed that um, we can take this potential energy landscape and identify each of these local minima in the landscape, and he called them inherent structures. So these local minima correspond to uh, mechanically stable configurations of atoms, where if you have 
um, your configuration of the system at a particular minimum or at a particular inherent structure, and you perturb it in any way. So you just have any like little minor change to the positions of any of the atoms because it's at a local minimum, any small perturbation would lead to an increase in the potential energy. And therefore the most stable configuration there locally is that inherent structure. Um, now the next term that Stillinger defined is called a basin. And a basin is all of the volume in this three N dimensional hyperspace. So this is a three N dimensional volume. All of that that drains to a particular minimum via steepest descent is what's called a basin. So basically, if you take any position in the potential energy landscape, go downhill from that position and get to that nearest minimum, all of that volume that drains to the same minimum is called a basin. And therefore there is one basin for each inherent structure in the system. And also we can take that entire potential energy landscape and divide it up into basins or par uh, partition the landscape into basins where each one of those basins has a single inherent structure. Now the number of inherent structures and therefore the number of basins is very large. It's approximately on the order of n factorial uh, number of inherent structures or basins in the system. Um, and that is a very large number of relative minima. Uh, of course, only one of them or a very few number of them can be the global minimum in the system. That global minimum would be defined by uh, the perfect crystal, which in this case, the energy or the potential energy of that perfect crystal is given by C times N, C being some um, potential energy per atom, and then multiplied by the number of atoms and all of the potential energy landscape then would need to be um, higher up or a, a greater than or equal to this global minimum of the perfect crystal. Now, the one of the key insights that Stillinger had in uh, developing this concept is that the kinetics of any system can be divided into two different contributions where there is a um, vibration that takes place within a given basin. So vibration that is about an inherent structure, a vibration about this local minimum within a basin, um, and that occurs on a relatively fast time scale. And then every once in a while, uh, a vibration will lead to the ability of the system to overcome one of these barriers and go into a neighboring basin. And that's what's called a configurational transition, when the system is able to overcome a transition point and get into a neighboring basin, that would be a configurational transition, and that occurs on a slower time scale compared to the vibrations themselves. So the potential energy landscape kind of naturally divides the kinetics of the system into a vibrational component uh, within a given basin. So this would be an intra-basin um, kinetics, kinetic motion, and then configurational transitions, which involve interbasin kinetics, or being able to transition from one basin to another basin. And this is a, a totally general picture that can be applied to any material system. And in principle, if one could calculate this uh, potential energy landscape of a system, you would have a complete description of both the thermodynamics and the kinetics of that system. The difficulty is, of course, in actually doing those calculations and in calculating this three N dimensional potential energy landscape for a system because it is so um, enormous in terms of the phase space that it occupies. But if we have an energy landscape mapped or a um, potential energy landscape that is sufficiently well mapped that we can capture um, the thermodynamics and kinetics of the system, this gives us the ability to solve for the kinetics on any arbitrary time scale and for any arbitrary temperature path here, uh, T of T. And we can do this uh, by solving a set of coupled master equations. So if you have omega number of basins in the system and some arbitrary temperature path here, T of T. Uh, and then if you have probabilities of occupying the various basins here, F sub alpha or F sub beta, 
um, the kinetics can be uh, represented by this master equation. So this shows the um, how the probability of occupying a given basin alpha here is changing as a um, with respect to time, uh, and this has two terms to it. One of them uh, is you know for every other basin beta not equal to alpha. Uh, what is the rate of the system going from any other basin beta into your current basin alpha? So this k beta alpha is the rate going from beta to alpha times the probability then of having started in beta. This whole summation here would be the total flow into your given basin alpha. And then this is minus the flow out of your given uh, basin alpha into your other basins beta. So this minus term here is the flow out. We've got the flow in minus the flow out. The flow out is given by our rate parameter here, k alpha beta, going from alpha to beta, times then the probability of having started in alpha. And if you count for the flow in minus the flow out, that gives you the total change of probability of your given basin alpha. And you'd have one equation for each one of the omega number of basins in the system. This gives you a set of omega coupled master equations. And then principle solving for that gives you the full uh, time evolution of the system. And of course, that's another big problem of how to solve for um, the kinetics of such a large set of coupled equations. And that will be the the subject of a later chapter in the book, which is specifically devoted to master equations. So we're going to cover that in detail in a later chapter. Uh, but for now here, this these rate parameters here, K, uh, these are approximated using uh, transition state theory, which is uh, basically what we've already covered in terms of the rate of jumping out of a potential energy well. You have a vibration uh, here out in front. Um, this can either be expressed as nu, the vibrational frequency, or in this case, this is the angular um, frequency here, omega, alpha, omega sub alpha divided by two pi. So this gives you how many attempts that you have to overcome a transition barrier per second. And each one of those attempts is like trying to get over the barrier. The probability of actually being successful is given by this Boltzmann probability term here, which is e to the minus um, a transition barrier that you have to overcome, divided by the amount of thermal energy that you have, kT. So this u alpha beta, this is the potential energy that corresponds to the transition point, minus u alpha alpha, which is the um, the potential energy of your starting basin. So the difference here gives you the activation barrier and going from the minimum to the transition barrier. Um, the greater the barrier, of course, the more difficult it is to overcome it. Um, higher temperature leads to uh, lower times and therefore faster rates as well. Um, and like I said, we'll come back to this in a later chapter and learn how to solve this in detail. Uh, but the next topic that we need to address is how do you actually find these inherent structures and transition points in a potential energy landscape? Uh, and there are several different techniques to do that. I'm going to show you one technique, which is called the eigenvector following technique, which systematically goes through the landscape to um, determine from a given um, inherent structure how do you find all of the connected transition points and then find the new inherent structures on the other side of those transitions? And this considers what if we have a uh, potential energy landscape here, phi, which is a function of the position vectors of each one of our n atoms. So there's R1, which is the position of atom 1, R2, which is the position of atom 2, dot, dot, dot all the way to Rn, the position of the nth atom. And the way to do eigenvector following is that we're going to um, take a walk through this three n dimensional potential energy landscape. And that walk is being guided by um, this Lagrange function L, um, which is telling us basically, how do we need to step through this landscape to, um, to point ourselves towards either a transition point or a minimum, depending upon what it is that we're trying to find. And this is based on the starting 
uh, potential energy at our starting position here, X zero. And then it's considering uh, contributions from the first derivative, or in other words, the slope of the potential energy landscape there locally. This is a um, slope, a transpose of a gradient vector multiplied by the step that you would take H. And then there is a second derivative contribution, which is governed by this Hessian matrix. The Hessian matrix is just the matrix of second derivatives. And so this is a, a measure of the local curvature of the landscape. The gradient vector here is, of course, a 3n uh, dimensional vector. And the Hessian matrix is a 3n by 3n matrix. Um, and so those have to be calculated to get the full description of the local slope in all three n dimensions, and also the curvature along each of the three n dimensions. And then we have an additional term here, which includes our Lagrange multipliers. And um, the choice of Lagrange multiplier is governed by whether we are trying to uh, minimize or uh, maximize energy along that particular direction. If we're trying to find a local minimum in the energy landscape, in other words, if we're trying to find an inherent structure, then what we want to do is to minimize the energy along all uh, along all of our directions. However, if we're trying to find a transition point, what we want to do is to maximize the energy along one eigendirection while simultaneously minimizing the energy along all the other directions. And the choice of Lagrange multiplier um, basically puts us along one path or the other, the path of minimization versus the path of maximization. Um, this table here shows the choice of Lagrange multipliers for uh, nine different cases. Basically, if, if you have your gradient vector here and we're looking along a given eigendirection, um, the gradient has three choices. The gradient could be negative, meaning that we could have a downward slope along that particular eigendirection. This would be corresponding to the case of Fi less than some threshold. Um, it could be essentially flat, meaning that the gradient is um, within um, or between the threshold and minus that threshold. So it's effectively flat along that eigendirection. Or the gradient could be positive. So you could have a negative slope, an effectively zero slope, or a positive slope along each of the eigendirections i. Now, um, in terms of the Hessian matrix of second derivatives, that needs to be diagonalized in order to determine each of these eigendirections, so each of these vibrational modes. And if it's a 3n dimensional potential energy landscape, that means that the Hessian matrix is a 3n by 3n matrix, which means that you're going to have 3n number of eigenvalues. And if along each one of those um, eigendirections, the eigenvalues are telling you um, the curvature along each of those directions. And like the slope, the curvature could either be negative, so you could have a negative curvature here, uh, which is bi less than some minus threshold. The curvature could be effectively zero here in the middle column, or the curvature could be positive over on the right-hand column. And this therefore gives us a three by three matrix of the three possibilities of the slopes along each eigendirection, and the curvatures along each eigendirection. And I've got um, you know, little drawings here that show you the, the local shape there. So if you've got a negative curvature with a negative slope, it looks like this shape in the upper left. If you've got a zero slope with a negative curvature, that's a local maximum. A negative curvature and a positive slope is shown on the lower uh, left, um, and so on. And the goal, if we're trying to find a uh, local minimum, the goal is to either have um, be in this uh, third column in the middle row where you've got a zero slope and a positive curvature because this is a local minimum along that eigendirection, or if it's flat along that eigendirection, that could also meet the criteria. Um, and if you get a minimum along all of the three n eigendirections, then you know that you've achieved a local minimum because you've minimized along um, every single one of the three n dimensions of the system. Now, the choices that we make to get to, to that local minimum depend on the Lagrange multipliers. Um, and the formulas uh, 
for the Lagrange multipliers are shown within each cell of the matrix here, uh, where if you've got a negative curvature and a negative slope, um, you choose that uh, based on the local eigenvalue and based on the local gradient and step size. This tells you how much you need to step uh, to go towards that minimum. And uh, likewise for each of these different cases. So if you follow um, this choice of Lagrange multipliers outlined here, you'll be progressively stepping through the landscape in a way that is working towards a minimum along all three and um, of the eigendirections. And once you've converged to that local minimum, then you can record that position down, record that energy, because that is the inherent structure. And when you find an inherent structure, to get the kinetics of the system, the next thing we need to do is to get the transition points that are surrounding that inherent structure. And that means that we need to maximize the energy along one and only one eigendirection. Um, so we need to choose which eigendirection we're going to maximize the energy along. And you can systematically go through and, and choose each one of the different eigendirections one at a time. Say, I'm going to maximize this eigendirection or the next one or the next one and get a whole set of possible transition points going from that particular minimum. Um, but the key is that, that the energy is maximized along only one of those eigendirections. And simultaneously, it needs to be minimized along all the other eigendirections. Um, this is what drives us toward a what's called a first order saddle point. A first order saddle point it has a maximum along one direction while being a minimum along the other directions. And the reason why we want the first order saddle point is that represents the minimum energy um, that needs to be overcome in order to get to the neighboring basin. There are higher order saddle points as well, where you've maximized the energy along more than one direction. But because those energies are higher, um, they're a lot, a lot less likely compared to the first order saddle point. So the relevant transition points we want to find are the first order saddle points that have a maximum along one eigendirection while being minimum along all the other eigendirections. Um, and so to find the transition point, we apply the minimization uh, procedure from the previous slide along all but one of the eigendirections and along the chosen eigendirection that we want to maximize the energy, we have this different set of the choice of Lagrange multipliers. Uh, again, depending on the local slope and the local curvature, um, now we're, we're choosing the Lagrange multipliers to guide our step towards a maximum rather than a minimum. And here the goal is to get to this um, green shaded cell uh, in the first column on the left, a local maximum where the slope is zero and uh, the curvature is negative. So that would be the local maximum. And once we've done that, then we found the transition point. And then we can go back to the other method to go to the other side of the transition point and minimize the potential energy to find the um, adherent structure on the other side of the transition point. And then progressively going through the landscape, you can build this network of all the inherent structures that are connected to each other uh, via transition points, and then use that information um, to plug into the master equations to solve for the kinetics of the system. Now, this is very difficult to visualize in three n dimensions. So let's consider a simple two-dimensional landscape, which was proposed by Banerjee back in 1985. And this shows a contour plot of this potential energy landscape, which is a function of two coordinates here, x and y. Um, there is a minimum here that is at the origin at 0, 0. And then you can see that there are two first order saddle points here. Uh, one on the right, uh, where this um, you've got a maximum and, and potential energy along this direction, while being a minimum in the orthogonal direction. And then the other one here in the lower part, where it's a maximum along this direction, and then a minimum along the orthogonal direction. And this shows application of the eigenvector following technique to find these two transition points. In other words, to find these two first order saddle points, where what we do is we start at the inherent structure, um, calculate the Hessian matrix, which in this case is a two by two matrix. When you diagonalize that and get the eigenvectors, that gives you the two um, 
the two uh, vibrational modes, the two normal modes of vibration, one of which is along this shallow axis here, and then the other, which would be on the higher vibrational axis, orthogonal to that. So we can arbitrarily choose to go, say, along this slower axis in one direction or in the opposite direction, which would be going in the solid black line versus the dashed black line in the opposite direction. Taking a step then, you see that the local curvature, the local slope has changed, and then we progressively step through trying to maximize along one eigen direction while minimizing along the other until it converges to that first order saddle point, which is shown here. And you can kind of see why this is called a saddle point because it's a maximum along this direction and a minimum along this direction. So it's kind of like sitting in a saddle where you've got one foot on this side, the other foot on this side. And then if you go in the opposite direction, so if you choose to go in this uh, opposite direction along the dashed curve, you can see that the eigenvector following uh, approach actually converges to the uh, other saddle point here, the other transition point with just four steps following that, that approach. So it's using all the information from the gradient and from the curvature to try to converge to those saddle points as effic efficiently as possible. And it does a really good job of doing so. And you know, what we need to do for a real system is the same technique, but instead of being on this two-dimensional energy landscape, uh, we would actually be in 3N dimensional space. So um, you know, it becomes a lot more complicated when we have to calculate the gradient vector and um, the Hessian matrix and diagonalize it in 3N dimensions. But conceptually, it's the same as what I'm showing here for two dimensions. Now, when we get to higher dimensional systems, because of the problem with uh, visualizing it, um, there is another method to aid in that visualization, and, and that's called a, a disconnectivity graph. And the disconnectivity graph, which is shown here on the right, is another representation of the potential energy landscape um, that on the left is shown in a continuous form. So for example, this is a three atom cluster. In this case, this is a three atom cluster of selenium and the continuous potential energy landscape as a function of bond angle. So this is keeping two of the bond lengths the same and just varying the bond angle. The potential energy landscape as a function of bond angle is calculated shown, showing here. There are three minima, A, C, and E. Those are the three inherent structures in the system. And then there are two transition points here, B and D, that govern the transitions among those three inherent structures. Um, now this is, we can plot this in a continuous format because we're just varying one variable in this case. Uh, but the more convenient way to represent this is in the disconnectivity graph on the right, where here the y-axis is the same, it's still potential energy. But now the x-axis, instead of being a specific structural parameter like bond angle, the x-axis just becomes some arbitrary configurational space. And the endpoints here give the inherent structures. So this point A, this is the closed triangular configuration, which corresponds to the bond angle of uh, about 60 degrees. And the energy here of this minimum, the energy of the inherent structure, is the energy of this A position here on the disconnectivity graph. The slightly lower energy configuration is this open triangular configuration here, C, with the bond angle closer to 120 degrees. And you can see that this C is positioned lower because the potential energy um, of that configuration is lower. Um, the third one is the E configuration, which is much higher in energy because it's less energetically favorable. This is with a 180 degree bond angle, so it's a straight line configuration of the three atoms. Now this A, C, and E, these are the three inherent structures, the three minima. They are connected by the transition points B and D. So to get uh, from E to anything else, uh, you have to go through this transition point D. This is this local maximum of potential energy. So its potential energy is positioned that corresponds to that local maximum. And so to either get to E or to get from E to someplace else, you have to go through this D point. Um, between A and C, there is a lower transition point, which is given by B. So the transitions between A and C 
have to go through B, but if you want to get to E, it has to go through D. And so this is a more convenient way to represent um, the potential energy landscape. And if you've got a certain amount of energy, like the amount of energy here shown by the dashed line, this means that you can be in either inherent structure A or C, but there's not enough energy to overcome the barrier to make a transition. If you've got this higher level of potential energy, then the transitions are freely allowed between A and C, but you'd be unable to get over um, the D barrier. And likewise, if you're at much higher temperatures, then transitions are freely allowed among all three of the enhanced structures. Now, if we add just one more atom, uh, this is a four atom cluster of selenium, you can see that um, the potential energy landscape gets quite a bit more complicated and that there are additional minima that are possible with additional combinations of bond angles, closed versus open configurations, and the potential energy landscape here um, can capture that complexity better when you represent it using a disconnectivity graph, where you can see here that the lowest energy configuration is this um, four atom chain where you've got 120 degree bond angles. Um, you've got you know, less favorable configurations like this uh, rhombus here with B or with C, this incorporates one um, 60 degree angle, a different torsion angle here between C and E or C and D. With E, there's a 180 degree bond angle, and then you've got the various transition states between the two of them. So just adding one more atom makes the landscape quite a bit more complicated. Um, now, the next thing that we need to consider is what if, instead of having a constant volume system, we have a constant pressure system? So in other words, instead of an isochoric system, we have an isobaric system. Now, instead of having the potential energy landscape, what we really want is the potential enthalpy landscape, or just simply the enthalpy landscape, which includes both the potential energy contribution as well as the PV contribution to the enthalpy, the pressure times volume contribution. And here, um, calculating the, um, or doing the eigenvector following technique is a lot more difficult because if we were to do a Taylor uh, expansion of the enthalpy here, um, some parts of it are straightforward, uh, but because we are, we can vary not just the atomic positions, but also the volume of the system, that means that the dimensions of the simulation cell are varying too. And if the length of the simulation cell here is denoted L, we can um, expand the, uh, or do the Taylor series expansion here with respect to the atomic coordinates here, xi, or with respect to the uh, dimension of the simulation cell L, we can have the curvature with respect to positions, the curvature here with the second derivative with respect to L. The problem comes with the mixed derivatives of L and positions, because if you're changing the size of the simulation box, then the positions of the atoms need to be scaled. And so therefore these two terms here, which have either taking the second derivative first with respect to position and then length, or the opposite, first with respect to length and then position, these actually give two different results because uh, of the, con the connection between changing the length and changing the positions. Uh, and the fact that these two terms are not equal um, and in fact, this is the relationship here that the second derivative of the enthalpy with respect to first X and then L is equal to the second derivative of, with respect to enthalpy of first L and then X plus one over L times the change of enthalpy with respect to position. Um, this makes it a lot more complicated to, um, to perform this eigenvector following approach um, because calculating the um, um, Hessian matrix becomes a lot more difficult. So the solution to this for an isobaric system with an enthalpy landscape rather than a potential energy landscape is to use what's called a split step eigenvector following technique where um, you follow the flow chart shown here where at first there is a step of the box length with fixed normalized particle positions. So these are particle positions normalized to the box length. So in this case, you're just changing the box length by itself, um, keeping the relative uh, or the normalized pos positions of the atoms the same. 
And then there is um, changing the particle positions with a fixed box length. So it, it bypasses this problem of um, the these having these two terms that are uh, not equal to each other in the Taylor series expansion by just changing the box size and then just changing the atomic positions and stepping through alternating between these two until you've reached the criteria for either a minimum or a transition point um, in the enthalpy landscape. So it's alternating between these two different steps until you've achieved the criteria. And then if you put all of this together, um, basically what you do is you find an initial minimum. This is where you start. From that initial minimum, you'd find transition points um, by systematically going up the, uh, uh, or traversing along different eigenvectors to find different transition points. If it is a new transition point, then you kind of push the position, the position of the system to the other side of that transition point to find the minimum on the other side. And then um, you can find new transition points from that new minimum and so on. And you go through this flow chart, checking all the different eigendirections of interest. Um, and then every time you get to a new minimum, finding new transition points from um, that new minimum. And just keep executing on this flow chart, exploring more and more locations of the enthalpy landscape until you've got enough statistics of the various inherent structures and transition points to get um, converged values of the thermodynamics and kinetics of the system. So as you can see, it's quite computationally intensive. And for a condensed system, this is just a 64 atom condensed system. So 64 atoms of selenium in this case with periodic boundary conditions, um, that these calculations can actually be quite involved. And, and this shows a disconnectivity graph representation of the enthalpy landscape of this 64 atom system. So constant pressure rather than constant volume. And there's just you know so many different inherent structures that you can calculate. So there's a whole field of study there out there that's just about um, developing efficient computational techniques for mapping um, potential energy landscapes or enthalpy landscapes. Um, another approach would be what if we could um, make a simplified version of an enthalpy landscape that captures some of the key physics that we want to capture, but isn't necessarily a direct representation of the real enthalpy landscape. And that is this concept of a minimalist enthalpy landscape here, uh, with a quick nod to Philip Glass, the minimalist composer, um, and who had nothing to do with the physics, but uh, is inspiration for the name. Um, and this is a simplified enthalpy landscape that captures some of that key physics. And in this case, this shows the enthalpy versus configuration space where there's two different groups of inherent structures. There's this group here, A, which has a, a higher enthalpy, um, but also potentially higher number of basins here. The degeneracy of them or the number of those basins is G sub A. And then you've got a lower enthalpy um, configurations here that also has a lower entropy, so a lower degeneracy, G sub B. And this is meant to capture two different types of kinetic processes that can occur called two different relaxation modes. And these are conventionally referred to as alpha relaxation and beta relaxation, also called primary relaxation, which is the same as alpha relaxation, and secondary relaxation, which is the same as beta relaxation, where alpha relaxation is a slower process, which would represent the transitions between these two groups of basins called metabasins. So there's one group here on the left, this is metabasin A, and then the other group of basins, which is metabasin B on the right, and there's a larger transition barrier between the two metabasins. So the, the uh, kinetics of overcoming that larger barrier correspond to the slower process, which is the alpha process or the primary process. And then within a given metabasin, there's faster transitions uh, because the barriers are smaller. And this is what's called uh, beta relaxation or secondary relaxation. Now, the parameters of the model that are of importance here would be the enthalpy difference between 
metabasin A and metabasin B. So this is the enthalpy of metabasin A, HA. The enthalpy in B is HB. So the difference between those two is important. Also, the barrier for uh, beta relaxation within a metabasin, that's the delta H sub beta. And then the alpha relaxation barrier here, which is delta H um, sub alpha. And the other two key parameters relate to the entropies of the two metabasins. That is the degeneracy of metabasin A, G sub A. That's the number of basins within that metabasin. And then the degeneracy of metabasin B, which is uh, G sub B. So that gives the entropy of lo being located in one or the other metabasin. And then what we assume is that we start off in a particular basin here. Let's say that we start off in metabasin uh, a at this particular basin here, I, so that the probability at zero time is one. And then the system initially spreads within that metabasin to these other Js. So there's the fast beta relaxation process that happens within the, the metabasin, then the slower alpha relaxation process, which is the intermetabasin transition. And with this setup, with this simplified minimalist landscape, we can actually solve for the kinetics of the system um, analytically, which is what is being done here, uh, where basically you um, have your initial uh, position here, I. We know that if you add up all the probabilities, they must always add up to one. You've got a transition rate in, um, that governs the alpha relaxation process, which is its frequency times its Boltzmann factor here of overcoming the alpha barrier. And then you've got this set of master equations here, which is um, you know, how fast are you going into, say, the other metabasin here, uh, so this df sub k, which would be the flow um, into it minus the flow out of it. And these equations are actually simple enough that you can solve them. And if you want to go into the details, I'd suggest that you check out um, the paper here that's referenced two slides ago. But what you can get is then um, these closed form expressions for the evolution of the probabilities um, of each of these three cases here. So the probabilities of being in the other metabasin, the probability of um, draining out of the starting basin, and then the probability of being in the other um, basin, basins within that same metabasin here, J. And so this gives you the time evolution for all of these probabilities. The transition into the other metabasin here is what governs alpha relaxation. And then the transitions within a metabasin is what governs beta relaxation. And what we're going to see is that those occur on two different time scales. So, for example, this plot shows you the probability of occupying uh, various basins. You can see that um, as a function of time that there is a short time scale transition that takes place. That is the beta relaxation and then a longer time scale transition, which is the alpha relaxation. And this is just given for this particular set of parameters. And you can adjust the parameters to um, emphasize one or the other types of effects. And uh, you can vary the parameters. This is shows results as a function of temperature, um, or this is as a function of different activation barriers. And you know the nice thing about the minimalist landscape approach is not only can you get a closed form solution, you can also systematically go in and vary parameters to see what type of response you get. Um, so that previous slide was changing the alpha relaxation barrier. This is changing the beta relaxation barrier. Again, the full details, uh, I think, don't need to be covered in this lecture, but you're welcome to check out um, that paper for more information. So to summarize here, the energy landscape approach is um, based on a separation of vibrational and configurational degrees of freedom. Um, we can map out the potential energy landscape or the enthalpy landscape of a system uh, using an eigenvector following approach. Uh, this is done in three n-dimensional space for real systems, uh, or but that's very computationally intensive. You can also develop simplified landscape representations such as the minimalist landscape approach.
So that is all for now. Thank you all. And I will see you next time.